I see we're right at 12.30, um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Um, but before I actually do jump into what I came here to talk about, um, I want us all to take a moment to pray for those in Afghanistan, Lebanon, Haiti, Palestine, and everywhere else in the world that is trapped in some sort of disaster, oppression, or strife. I think words cannot adequately convey the feelings of dread and horror that we see, and we pray for the safety of every single one of our brothers and sisters, wherever they may be and pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects them and grants them strength to endure these trials. Um, by way of introduction, um, my name is Insia and I'm a third year law student at Texas Law. And I'm here to share with you some reflections about Muharram and Karbala. As many of you may know, yesterday was Ashura, the 10th of Muharram. This date marks the day the Prophet's grandson, Imam Hussein ibn Ali was martyred along with his family and companions on the plains of Karbala in modern day Iraq. The seeds of this event were sowed well before the day in question. Yazid, the tyrant oppressor of the time, flagrantly abandoned the core values of Islam and implemented oppression everywhere where his rule touched. He demanded that the Imam give allegiance to him and his rule, but the Imam was aware that giving allegiance to such a man meant sanctioning his evil behavior. However, he was also aware that a decision to refuse to give allegiance would likely cost him his life and the life of those that he loved and cared about. The Imam still refused to give allegiance and began traveling towards the land of Kufa, where many of his followers had expressed support for him. Along the way, Yazid's forces intercepted him in the land of Karbala. They cut off water from the camps and cornered the small group of Imam Hussein's family and companions. After days of thirst, the army massacred the Imam and his followers. An army of tens of thousands went up against a mere 72. They killed without honor like barbarians and they shot arrows into the neck of everyone from a six month old baby to the oldest of companions. They severed the heads of all of the martyrs and mounted them on spears. They trampled the bodies with the hooves of their horses. And after all of the men were killed, the tyrant army attacked the women and children they left no one without burning their tents, beating and slapping them, snatching their veils, and eventually taking them captive. They took the captives to the streets of Kufa and Damascus and paraded them around. Despite this, the sister of Imam Hussein carried on her brother's mission and his values. We have Karbala today because of her bravery and her courage and her valiance in the face of every trial. Garbala and the message of Imam Hussain encompasses a universe of lessons and reflections. A universe that, frankly, not I nor anyone else can truly convey. The event of Ashura and Garbala and the land has an electricity that has pulsed through generations. It's an electricity, an entrancement that draws in the masses, regardless of religion, race, or background. Years before the events of Ashura even took place, the Holy Prophet said that in the hearts of the believers, there is a heat with respect to the martyrdom of Imam Hussein, a heat that never subsides. And looking at the world around us, that fact becomes abundantly evident. Imam Hussein is not bound to any one nation or religion. The doors of his lessons, sacrifices, and mercy are open for every single person. And as is always the case, swarms of people flood to Karbala every year, millions upon millions. Among them, people of all faiths, all races, all nationalities come together under one banner, the banner of the man who stood alone 1400 years ago. And today, those millions around the world echo his name and remember his sacrifice and promise to live by his principles. Karbala is nothing short of a majestic miracle of revolution, patience, and justice. When I was asked to speak about Ashura and reflect on Muharram and Karbala, I spent a lot of time thinking about what to say. For those of you who might know me, I'm quite the talker, um, but with this, I really did struggle. For all of the words that I say all day, none of them, I think, could truly convey the love for Imam Hussein and the value of his missions. At the time when Karbala actually happened, it was a brave and courageous stand against injustice and oppression. In the years that followed, it became a rallying cry for truth. And today, it's the core of our mission as Muslims and as humans. 
To that end, I hope to share just two small reflections with you, even though two reflections is not anywhere near what this event warrants or deserves. Like I said, the events on the day of Ashura are littered with tragedy. It's said that in battles before Karbala, the men of the Bani Hashim tribe would be always be the first to go to battle. They were the ones who went first because it had the highest chance of dying first. And it was a sign of courage and of honor. On the day of Ashura, these same men waited and they waited until every other companion had been martyred before they went to fight themselves. That day, everyone was going to be killed and being killed early was easy, but living with the tragedy of the massacre was much harder. Under the heat of the desert sun, one by one, the companions and family members were slaughtered. And I do use the word slaughtered intentionally because being, being killed is one thing, but slaughtering, maiming, and butchering is another. Casualties of war are one thing, but shooting an arrow into the mouth of a six month old baby is something else altogether. Death is one thing, but to trample the bodies of the martyrs with the sharpened hooves of horses and slicing off their heads is absolutely barbaric. A battle is one thing, but imprisoning, torturing, and beating the women and children of the martyred is something much beyond words. Imam Hussein's sister, Bibi Zainab, was among the captured after the events of Ashura. Her hijab was stolen and she was bound with rope, taken in front of the oppressive ruler Yazid. He asked her how she found the way Allah treated her family. He asked in a way that was meant to taunt and hurt her, but she simply said, I saw nothing but beauty. When I think about Ashura and Karbala, those words really do echo in my mind. On the surface, there truly is so much pain and so much tragedy. But beneath that, there's a beauty that erupts and envelops everything around it. Imam Hussein's stand for justice in the face of the height of oppression is magnificent. Today, when we're faced with the smallest of inconveniences, we throw up our hands in frustration and anger. That day in Karbala, the Imam was patient in the face of every trial. At every trial, he never forgot Allah. And in fact, he never stopped praising and thanking his Lord. Karbala tells tales of beauty at every single turn. Whether you look at the loyalty of Imam Hussein's flag bearer and his brother, Hazrat Abbas, when we see that flag raised high in the air today, we lift our heads with pride for that man represented the epitome of devotion. Another example is when you look at the member of the enemy army who came to Imam Hussein the night before Ashura and he begged for forgiveness. This was a man who had cut off the water from the small children of Imam Hussein and trapped him in that desert land alone. But the Imam embraced and forgive, forgave him in just a moment. When we go to Allah to ask for our forgiveness, Imam Hussein's magnificence drives us to beg for forgiveness for all of the sins we commit every day because there's a beauty in that forgiveness. When we look to our brothers and sisters, that forgiveness is something we can carry on each and every day. The beauty of Karbala is not limited, however, to the events of that day or the immediate aftermath. Karbala's beauty, the love that it emits, is so powerful that to this day, that love is incomparable. Take, for example, the 40th day after the martyrdom of Imam Hussein, which is commemorated every single year. In the days leading up to that commemoration, pilgrims will begin walking from the city of Najaf, Iraq, all the way to Karbala on foot. It's a journey that takes about three days and it can be quite difficult. Along the way, locals have been preparing all year to serve these pilgrims. They provide all kinds of food, water, shelter, medical care, massages, and anything and everything in between that one could ever need. No money ever changes hands. Rather, it is the love of one man and his message that brings everyone together. When I saw that for the very first time, I was astounded. I remember my father had a huge blister on his leg and he is one of those people who just needs his Pakistani ointment every single time something like that happens. We were sitting at one of the rest stops and he kept talking about how he wanted that and how the blister was aching and he had two more days of walking left. All of a sudden a man came and sat next to him and just looked at my father I don't even think he knew English or Urdu, which my father was speaking at the time, but he reached into his bag and he pulled out 
a, a little tube of the very same ointment my father had used for years and handed it to him and then got up and walked away. In that moment, my father said, there is no miracle like the miracle of Imam Hussein. There's a love, a power and electricity that just flows through every person who's there. And it's something that it's difficult to comprehend. If you think about it, no one really knows how those 25 million people who visit the Imam on the 40th day fit into that one very small city. No one knows how every single one of those people are fed. No one knows how this mass is served and cared for. What we do know is that it's a miracle. It's a miracle that erupts from the love of Imam Hussein such that no person sleeps hungry and no person goes without. I often say that the logic of Karbala is one thing, but the emotion and the love it inspires is so much stronger. Your brain, I think, understands the logic, but when your heart feels the emotional connection, there's nothing in this world that is more important or more strong. But beyond this incomprehensible love, there's a tangible mission to Karbala as well, one that continues to this day. 1400 years ago, when Imam Hussein stood with 72 companions, he stood against an army of tens of thousands. He stood not to gain power or wealth, but to rise against a tyrant who threatened the very soul of Islam. He rose with the knowledge and understanding that this rise was going to kill his family, his companions, and imprison his sisters, daughters, and, and wives. But after all of that, the Imam stood firm. He never let himself falter. On the very last moments of the day of Ashura, when every one of the companions and family members had been martyred, the Imam faced the enemy army once more and he called out, is there anyone to help me? I remember when I was young, this notion really confused me. Why did the Imam call out to these people? These were people who had killed and slaughtered his family and companions without any mercy. While I cannot pretend at all to understand the motivations and reasons, what I have realized is that this call was not just to those standing in front of the Imam in that moment. That call echoes from generation to generation, from land to land. Is there anyone who will help me? The call of the Imam is not limited to one day or one place. It's a call to justice, to truth, to courage and bravery. Centuries later, we exist in a world where oppression is commonplace. There is not one corner of this earth where some kind of oppression and suffering has not taken root. Our time, just like every other time before us, has a tyrant of some kind subjugating and causing harm. This call is just as much for us as it was for the army in front of the Imam at that moment. It's a call towards justice, equality, liberation from injustice, whether that be racism, colonialism, or classism, they are not empty words to be heard and forgot about. They are responsibility for each and every one of us. Today, we're so blessed. Many of us live in relative comfort in this country, and even the ability to remember Imam Hussein in spaces like this is a blessing. We sometimes forget the blood that has been shed to carry on this legacy and deliver it to us over the generations. We forget that remembering the Imam and his mission is not a compartmentalized portion of our lives, but rather a legacy intertwined with who we are. As Muslims and rather as human beings, our focus should always be on the truth and justice. And there is no better beacon of that than the Imam. Garbala in short is the epitome of that beauty and of that justice, a call to humanity that guides us as humans and as Muslims. It's a never ending endeavor. Beauty and justice are just two parts of this greater message. When you begin to look at Garbala, there's a universe of lessons to be learned and applied in our everyday lives, especially as oppression grows, especially when we look around the world and see the pain and suffering, it's important to look to Garbala and learn and grow from those lessons and those moments. It's our duty to remember that call and to tie ourselves to that mission. In a constantly changing world, Garbala is one of those things that will always remain relevant and always remain constant. Thank you so much for indulging me as I try to convey a little bit about what Garbala has meant to me over the years and what I've learned. It's been an honor to spend some time with you today. 
And I thank you so much again for spending some time with me as well. Thank you so much, Isaac Lacher, uh, Sister Encia. Uh, really, really do appreciate uh, your reflection. Um, it's absolutely beautiful and you know absolutely well timed. Uh, you know, th there's there's not much words you can really say. Uh, you know, when, when it comes to Ashura, when it comes to Muharram, when it comes to uh, Imam Hussein Radiullah uh, Anhu. But we really appreciate you taking this, uh, allowing us to hold the space for. Um, an event that, uh, and a lesson that oftentimes gets pushed to the margins. And so we wanted to make that a priority to give that the space. But um, I'm going to just make some quick announcements. And uh, as is as is regular for uh, uh, for those of you who have joined us before, you're welcome to uh, hang on for uh, a few minutes afterwards. And if you'd like to share any reflections or um, give uh, some well-deserved props to Sister and Zia, that is, that is also welcome. Um, but just some quick uh, just some quick announcements from Muslim Space. Uh, as you may have seen, if you are not uh, up to date with any of uh, Muslim Space's upcoming events uh, or um, upcoming initiatives, uh, you can you can subscribe to our newsletter uh, or you can stay on with our uh, WhatsApp channel. So uh, there's a couple different ways to go about it. Uh, just go to our website, muslimspace.org, and you can either subscribe to the newsletter or uh, join the WhatsApp announcement channel uh, or both. And uh, you can stay tuned for uh, our upcoming events. But uh, just some quick uh, things that are going to be upcoming uh, not immediately, but in the in the next few weeks, we have a Quran halakha that will be coming up uh, on the first Sunday of every month, and uh, this uh, this halakha will be on Surah Asr. So uh, September fifth is the first Sunday of September, and so at eleven a.m. we'll have a reflection uh, and Quran halakha and discussion. Uh, we're also resuming the book club. So. Muslim Spaces Book Club is uh, returning, and the uh, the book that we'll be focusing on for the month of September will be The Forgotten Queens of Islam by Fatima Marnisi, and that will be taking place on Friday, September 24th at 7 p.m. Usually we just have a discussion, but uh, the link to the book and everything else uh, is in our newsletter, but uh, if you go onto our website, again, we'll have our information there as well. As always, the chaplain office hours and uh, community check-in times is uh, available seven days a week by appointment. You can book an appointment with myself uh, at muslimspace.org and click on chaplain and our page is there. Uh, and then lastly, we have a new uh, blog series that is going on. Um, so we have an incredible mental health blog that is there. We've also added a uh, faith reflections blog space uh, under the chaplain's uh, page. So you're welcome to check that out. Um, at the moment, we just have, we just started out with two posts there. So just some quick reflections, but I'm hoping for as we develop this as we develop this blog series that reflections such as the one Sister Encia uh, gives will be will be reflected there. So this will not just be a uh, one person reflection that will be there. This will be reflections from uh, different persons, different uh, you know uh, traditions within Islam, different uh, communities of belief and things like that. But the idea of it is to provide a space for that. So um, I'm hoping I'll reach out to Sister and see afterwards and maybe we can have this reflection there as well, but uh, more, more of this to come. Uh, and yeah, so the last thing to, to just lift up, we are going to actually be having a Halakha series focusing on justice. It's going to be called Upholders of Justice, and it will come uh, starting in September, but it will be every third Thursday of the uh, of the month starting September until December. And we're going to be focusing on justice in Islam and not just social justice, but justice to oneself, justice to the community around us, justice to the environment. So many different angles you can look at justice and uh, keep a lookout for that. We'll be announcing uh, guest speakers as well as what will be going on there. But uh, yeah, at this time, if anybody would like to reflect anything or uh, you know, just say salam, uh, you, are, you are welcome to have the space. But again, Sister Nsiya, Jazakallah we really appreciate your perspective and we really look forward to having you back um, for uh, for another reflection. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank you on behalf of Muslim Space for uh, coming here. Thanks for having me. It was really great to spend a little bit of time with y'all, um, even if it's over Zoom. Absolutely, absolutely. And yeah, uh, exactly what uh, Brother Muhammad said. Uh, you know, the Asalaamu Alaikum oh, and yeah, my duas, my duas for all of you young people, you're doing a wonderful job. It was very, very um, heartwarming for the young lady to say this today. Jazakallah Bita.
Absolutely. Absolutely. And of course, as I mentioned, I apologize, there was a little bit of technical difficulty. So it said recording stop, but uh, inshallah, we'll have uh, the uh, recording in on, on Facebook and we'll, we'll upload it to our YouTube channel. So uh, we'll, we'll have it uh, available for you all as well, if you missed any part of that. Um, but yeah, no, uh, thank you again, Sister Nsia. I just wanted to ask uh, with respect to um, with respect to Ashura, with respect to um, you know the, the shahada of uh, Mulana Imam Hussein, uh, is there anything you could uh, maybe part off with us, uh, those of us who are not uh, you know part of the the Shi'i community um, who may not have uh, you know the the privilege to have the narrative of Imam Hussein and uh, of the Alul Bayt uh, and the stories you know as much in our common discourse, uh, what, what can we do during the time of Ashura or at least Muharram um, to keep the example, keep the sacrifices in, in, in our discourse? What, what can we do uh, to, to center that narrative rather than as often is done in non-Shi'i circles is often put to the margins? Um, just something that we could take away. Yeah, I think um, one of the, I think, great tragedies of this era is there's so many places where we see reflections of Karbala kind of playing out, right? Like if you look at Afghanistan, some of the oppression that's going on there, people learn a lot from Karbala and from the message of Imam Hussein and how to tackle these problems. And I think one of the things that, you know, beyond just the time of Muharram is that is valuable is to think about those models of patience, those models of justice and using those to guide our own advocacy, um, you know, especially when you're looking at some of the more sensitive issues in this time, it's very easy to just be quiet because you're worried about school or work or what your neighbors will think. But I think remembering that there is a fearlessness to standing for the truth is so important. Um, and you're just being educated and aware and using those to apply in very practical situations helps make that message very real. Um, yeah. Awesome, that's beautiful. And, and inshallah, like I said, we'll, we'll inshallah continue to do it um, as we can. Um, I think there's a lesson here for all Muslims, regardless of whether they are Shiite or Sunnis or anything else. The uh, main uh, lesson that we learn uh, from uh, Mara, uh, Imam Hussain Shahada and his companions and his family is you should be willing to sacrifice everything for truth and the glory of Islam. And the one thing we can do uh, is to not only practice this thing during the uh, month of Muharram, but throughout our lives and send th how thousands and thousands of durud and salam on uh, Mara Imam Hussein and his progeny, and of course, the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Absolutely. I mean, and uh, brother Muhammad, and that's that's exactly it. That's exactly it. that. This is uh, I, I I think uh, Wajih had said it that uh, every uh, every day is Ashura, every land is Karbala, and I think that just just what brother Muhammad said is exactly that. That this sacrifice was not a uh, a one one and done type deal. This is something that lives on. Um, it's lesson. It's a, it's a, it's significance for us every single day. Uh, and I really appreciate you tying the the relevance to the current events that are going on, especially with Afghanistan and other areas where oppression is found and injustice is found to see that this narrative, see that this story is, uh, and the lessons of it are absolutely relevant, uh, that they're not just something we find in between the binds of a book, there's something we see in our everyday life. And so uh, again, Jazak Lahir from, uh, from Muslim Space Sister and see, I want to be mindful of everybody's time here, but uh, if you all have any questions or anything like that, um, we can definitely uh, get you on touch. But thank you so much again for, for being a part of uh, our, our khutbah. And inshallah, we will uh, love to have you back uh, and, and really appreciate your time. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, sister and Zia. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. <laughs>